I'm going to now pass you over to Andrew Stanton, who, who's the program manager at Aspire uh, Sports, based down in Birmingham. They're a company that we work closely with um, and have done for um, the last three years now. So, um, yeah, I'll hand over to Andrew. Thanks for joining us, Andrew. No problem. Am I a host? So can I share my screen or do you need uh, to just check settings? Just made you the host Brilliant. now. <laughs> Thank you. Let me see if I can get this set up properly. So I can see what I'm talking about. I think we're there. Great. Yep. Thanks, Adam. So, yeah, my name's Andrew. I'm from an organisation called Aspire Active Education Group, and we're based in the West Midlands. And our mission is to end physical inactivity. And there's a number of ways we do this, but one way is through the work that we do in primary schools across the country. Um, so over the last few years, my role specifically has been looking at are there any other ways in addition to break times and clubs and lunch times and competitions and PE lessons to build more movement into other lessons, um, specifically maths and English. Um, and the way that we do this is through physically active learning. So a big project of mine over the last few years has been to write the Maths on the Move programme, which is now delivered um, to hundreds of classes each week across the country. And right now we're hard at work on the English on the Move programme. So that aims to teach spelling, punctuation and grammar in an active manner. And that's currently being trialled in schools in Birmingham, um, Southampton, Bradford, Leeds, and two local schools to many of you on the call um, in Lancashire, which is delivered by Pro Sports Coaching. So around four years ago, we started a partner network, which allows our programmes to be delivered by a fantastic network of um, like-minded organisations all across the country. So we're near 40 organisations now, and it's my job to do all the practical operation training. So for all of the educators going into schools, um, I would do their training before they go in. And prior to this, um, prior to being at Aspire, I taught years five and six in a school in Staffordshire um, for a number of years, and that's where I first started to trial different active games in maths and English. So I've been asked to talk today all about physically active learning. So we'll, we're going to cover what physically active learning is, why children benefit from physically active learning. Um, so while we're doing that, we'll look at some of the research surrounding physical activity and its impact on learning. Um, and then I'd really like to share with you a few activities so that you can actually go away and deliver some of these physically active learning tasks in your school right away. Um, and as mentioned with all the other workshops, if you do have any questions or comments, or equally, if you'd just like to share something that your school's doing in this sphere, then um, please just get involved in the chat. Um, so what is physically active learning? It's, it's all about integrating movement into the learning experience. So there's many ways this can be achieved. In its um, simplest form, a physically active learning task might take a piece of work, which has traditionally been done at a table and chair, and simply transform it to a physically active learning task by scattering the questions and answers around the learning area and asking the children to move um, from question to answer to show their understanding. And this task is just a really simple decimals and percentage task, but this simple style of activity can obviously be applied to any form of activity which has a question and answer. Uh, and a little later on, I'll share with you a couple of resources which you can print out and try in your classroom or in your hall or on the field straight away. Um, so other examples of physically active learning in maths could be that you give children a tape measure and you ask them to estimate the length of items around the classroom and then go and find the items and actually measure them or give them certain dimensions of items and they've got to go and measure things and try and match the dimensions and record their findings. This second example is taken from one of our home learning sheets that we produced during lockdown, but this asks the children to arrange different sticks, spaghetti sticks in this case, but it could be pencils or lollipop sticks to show 
um, different Roman numerals, but equally without any resources, you can do this um, as a gymnastics balance, children working together to show a certain number or a certain Roman numeral. Or I've seen it done very well if you're teaching time. So schools that have this built into their playground brilliant, but if you don't with cones or with chalk, teaching analog clocks by the children actually lying down and being the minute hand or the hour hand is something a little bit different, um, just slightly different to you know, writing it on a, on a whiteboard. Um, and it could be that if they were doing 3D shapes, that instead of um, you know, matching 3D shapes to the properties, they actually explore the school grounds um, to find real life examples. And this form of exploration and inquisitive learning is something that's you know, rightly celebrated in early years, as Brian mentioned earlier, um, but it seems really difficult to fit in and complete as children move through key stage two. So creating opportunities where children can continue their learning, but also be up and mobile is really important to me. And these three examples are just simple maths activities. Many of you probably do these in some of your lessons at the moment, um, but the concept of physically active learning can be applied effectively to many different subject areas. And we'll touch on a couple of resources that you can download after this workshop and, and use with your class if you'd like to. But first, I'd like to talk about um, the reasons why we, would, we should do physically active learning. And first of all, I know it's been mentioned a couple of times today, but from a health perspective, children in general are sitting, uh, are sitting more and spending less time moving than ever before. You know, all reports globally and in the UK are suggesting that over the last few years, children's physical activity levels are at an all time low. So it's recommended that children should, between the ages of five and 17, do 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. And just to clarify this, this has been a change quite recently. So um, the last two years, the recommendations being that it should be um, an average of 60 minutes across uh, per day across the week. In 2011, the, uh, the chief medical officer's guidelines were that all children should engage in moderate to vigorous intensity activity for at least 60 minutes and up to several hours a day. So when that was actually the guidelines, the percentage of children that were meeting those guidelines was less than a fifth. It was around 18% of children that were meeting those guidelines. Um, however, in the 2019 chief medical officer's guidelines, there was a change made. Um, so this is taken from those guidelines and it says, that there's more flexibility now because there's no evidence which supports a specific minimum daily threshold of 60 minutes. So they now recommend an average number of 60 minutes to be achieved across the week. So taking the 60 minutes, Childhood Obesity Plan sets out that it should be school's responsibility to try and provide 30 minutes of physical activity within the school day and 30 minutes should be accumulated outside of school time. However, unfortunately, we know the majority of children aren't getting this amount of activity. So it's 44.9% of children that are currently meeting the guidelines. And if we look a bit closely at the fit, a bit more closer at the figures, I know Adam shared this at the start of the day, but just to recap, this graphic obviously shows the proportions of children in each category. So we have less children, um, less active children, active for less than 30 minutes a day, and the fairly active children. 30 up to an hour, and then the children meeting the guidelines. So 31.3% or 2.3 million children across the country are active for less than 30 minutes a day. And what we also now know is that during the lockdown period, some children will have had quite a prolonged period of time with little or no physical activity. So for some children, their opportunities to be active at school might be the majority of the physical activity that they actually do. So it can be really crucial for some children to support them in helping achieve their recommended amount. Um, and this image is shown with credit to Andy Daly-Smith, who's currently working at Bradford, but usually is at Leeds Beckett University. And they're doing some fantastic work in the area of physically active learning with their students. Uh, I'd recommend reading some of their studies if, if you do get the chance. But this graphic does show where the levels of physical activity start to drop. We know the amount of physical activity that a child does decreases year on year by around 4% from the age of seven. So as they move through key stage two, the level of engagement drops. And this might not be a surprise to many people if you think of how 
a key stage one classroom or an early years classroom is set up and then compare it to a key stage two classroom or timetable. And Leeds Beckett actually have done some work um, in looking at where, what's being taught at what time and how active the children are. And they found that in all of the schools that they went to, when they segmented the day into three lessons, lesson one before break in the morning, lesson two after, and then lesson three in the afternoon, the, break up, the breakdown of studies um, showed that the morning sessions were absolutely dominated by two subjects. It's, you know, it's no surprise that English and maths have this um, protected curriculum time in the morning, but the, the majority of a child's time during these lessons is in a very, very sedentary state. So it may usually be sat on the carpet or at a table or listening to the teacher or trying some activities, but majorly sat down. And um, the afternoons obviously provide a little bit more opportunity for different foundation subjects, but the research that they did showed that they were still heavily sedentary in many cases. So using physically active learning just sometimes within your timetables can be a really good way to help combat sedentary activity for children. And um, all that being said, and whilst it's important, I think, to keep being aware and understand the statistics surrounding movement and physical activity, I think it would be wrong to just purely think of adding movement to a lesson as a means of combating inactivity, because there are so many positive um, benefits of physical activity in developing the whole child. So aside from the health benefits, um, which I think are quite well documented, I'd like to share some of the, the wider benefits of doing physically active learning. So I've grouped some of the main reasons into these three different themes, uh, which are cognitive performance, the environment for learning, and purpose and retention. So if we start with cognitive performance, um, I'd like to share some research, which I find absolutely fascinating. Um, and it's by a scientist called Chuck Hillman, who was at the University of Illinois. And uh, all of Dr. Hillman's research is in the field of cognitive neuroscience, but he has a real special emphasis on physical activity and cognition in children. And he looks specifically at connections between physical activity and learning. So I saw this particular illustration, it's on the screen now, a number of years ago, uh, and it really resonated with me. And it made me want to learn more about the study and a bit more about brain development in children. Um, but in this particular study, they were looking at whether a single bout of exercise can affect learning in a positive way. That is, if you were to do some physical activity and then a cognitive task straight afterwards, could you temporarily boost your brain's power? Um, or conversely, if you've been sat for a long time in an inactive state, is your brain in the best state for learning? Um, and the pictures on the screen now are a composite of the brain scans of children. So what Dr. Hillman did was with these students, he asked them to take part in a cognitive task twice. One was at rest. So after a period of sitting quietly and the other was after a 20 minute treadmill walk. And each time the pupils took part in the cognitive task, the electrical activity in the brain was monitored through an EEG scan. So the picture on the left shows the students after a period of rest and then on the right it's after a 20 minute treadmill walk and um, so the test was the same same students the only variable that changed was the period of time that preceded the test so what we can see from this is that exercise allowed these children to recruit more brain power there was more brain activity going on when they were tackling the questions after they'd been active and it's also worth noting that to bring about this change, they only completed a brisk walk at a moderate state. So the treadmill walk was at 60% of their max heart rate. Um, so this wasn't even a vigorous intensity exercise. But what it does indicate is that even a small amount of moderate intensity activity could have a positive uh, impact on cognition in young people, basically showing that pr uh, physical activity primes the brain for learning. And um, I think you know, mark it the nail on the head. I used to, when I taught year six, I used to hate wet play. I really hated it. Um, but one of the reasons was because the children just didn't have time to run up any steam. Um, they need this opportunity to go out, be active and prepare their brains for learning again. And it's not just this piece of research. There's more research out there, which indicates positive associations between being physically active. And studies have seen that, you know, children are able to improve their focus, 
they can improve their attention and time on task or positive attributes when you're talking about learning. So that's one of three pieces of research that's looking at the immediate effect of physical activity. The same scientist um, took this research a bit further and he divided students into two groups. These were nine and 10 year old children. So there were higher fit and lower fit children. And the criteria was if you could run a quarter mile, so one lap of the athletics track without stopping, you were classed as higher fit. If you had to stop on the run, you were in the lower fit category. And then he asked the children to do um, a cognitive task again, and he used brain imaging scans to monitor the activity that was going on in the brains. And what they found was that the higher fit kids were allocating more attentional resources to support them in answering the questions when they took the test. And he tried this with an easier test and then a more difficult test. And the higher fit children were seen to have much greater brain activity. So when it came to the more difficult test, the lower fit students couldn't recruit enough brain power to support them in answering the questions. So this actually supports the idea that if children are more active, physically active, it will support them academically, not just in the immediate time that follows the activity, but in general. And um, the same scientist, last bit of research from this scientist, took this a whole step further and um, he created a program called the Fit Kids program. And it was a much larger scale study, recruited 221 children to take part, and it was across nine months. So the 221 pupils were eight and nine year olds again. So all in that key stage two primary age. And he split them into two groups. One was put into a wait list and the other children um, were put into the intervention group. So the wait list went about their normal school day as normal with no changes to the timetables. But the other group, the intervention group, took part in a nine month PE program. So every day there was a school day, they came in and did an extra hour of PE. So they did all kinds of different activities. The sessions were actually taught by people at the university who were training to be teachers. Um, and the waitlist would have been doing two hours a week of PE, but the intervention group had an additional five hours. Um, and at the end of the nine months, the children in both groups took cognitive tasks again. And the cross section of the brains, I'll share that with you now on the screen, shows the brain activity that was going on when they did the two tasks. So these activities, um, it probably isn't large enough for you to see. It says flank a task at the top and switch task at the bottom. So um, these are designed to measure accuracy and processing speed. It's the kind of task where you might have um, a bunch of arrows facing in different ways and you've got to select which way the middle arrow is facing. So it rewards you for being accurate and being fast with your answer. Um, so it's not like they were sitting the, you know, the key stage two sats with these electrode caps on, but there is transferability into the classroom based learning. And I find it really interesting because this study shows there's an undeniable link between physical activity and brain activity. So that's one of the reasons um, which is cognitive performance or cognitive function. The second is the environment for learning. Um, so the location and the context in which the children are learning in. So with Maths on the Move, our approach to physically active learning is to take the children out of their usual classroom setup. And what we find is that in turn modifies how the children um, think about and perceive the learning. So it can be really useful for children who potentially aren't confident in the subject area. They might have lost their love for the subject area or just feel like they can't do it. I know this happens a lot in maths. Um, but what we find is by embedding the learning within a game or a number trail, then the learning almost becomes disguised. Um, so whilst there is a specific focus and the educator knows exactly what he wants the children, he or she wants the children to learn, um, the children come at it with a different mindset and feeling towards learning. And the upside to this is it can have a huge potential as children start to make connections between things that they're seeing when they're in a more relaxed state in a physically active learning session um, and things that are going on in the classroom. So the confidence that you gain through physically active learning can sometimes pay dividends when you return to classroom based work. And I think in general, um, most, you know, everyone would agree that children are going to be more receptive to what you're teaching them 
and more motivated to take part and ultimately learn if, if what they're doing seems interesting and uh, they're actively involved. And with physical, physically active learning, it can be both a great way to motivate and engage the children, but also due to the nature of physically active learning, it's really hard to take a back seat and let the lesson pass you by. So it supports the retention of learning, um, which is the third theme. So I talked about purpose and retention, and uh, this is looking at the why we're doing the aspect of le uh, learning we're covering, and then how likely it is that we're going to, the children are gonna retain what's being taught. So an example in maths might be to actually ask the children to measure different sized areas in the school hall or playground, or give the children a perimeter to work with, and ask them to create the largest space and actually seeing visually a real life example of how the perimeter affects the area um, could be the spark that's needed to give these children like a long lasting learning effect. Um, a colleague of mine in the school who's the science coordinator at the time used to teach loads of aspects of science in a quite a physically active way. I remember teaching, I remember she taught the states of matter by asking the children to you know, imitate the properties of solids, liquids, and gases. Um, there was tug of wars when you're teaching balanced forces in science. And these kind of activities are more memorable because they're slightly different to the normal way of learning in the classroom. And when learning is seen in a slightly different way, it can really aid retention. Uh, so these are some of the reasons we found physically active learning to be really effective. Um, but I'd like to share with you some of the activities that you could actually go away and, and, and have a go at if you'd like to. And I'd love to do this in person with you so you could all actually get up and take part. But hopefully I'll be able to share some ideas across, across the pictures on the screen. So um, first of all, these are some cone games. We do these quite a lot in Maths on the Move. They're really popular. And these are really good for mental calculations, which are obviously needed right across the whole curriculum. So we start by putting the children into teams and then placing the teams around the edge of the working area um, for maths on the move we work with groups of up to 16 but this activity would work well with a whole class you just need more teams around the edge and then we scatter cones around the inner area you then have a small competition between the teams to collect the cones and we'll go into the different ways that they can do this in just a second um, but once all the cones have been collected you can start to do some maths activities with them. And there's a whole host of maths activities you can do. So if you were in year one, it might be that the children are literally just counting the cones that they've got or seeing how many more to make 10 or how many is one more, how many is one less than the number of cones that they've collected. They might look at another group and see the difference between the number of cones that they've got and another, and another group's cones. Um, you might put three different colours of cones out and ask the children to collect any cones they want and then at the end group them by colour and create a number sentence to add these cones up. Um, in key stage two we can then give these cones a value so in year three they start to learn to count in fours, eights, fifties and a hundred so you know working out their total point score based on the cones values a really fun activity, especially if you reveal the values after they've collected the cones and you can assign whatever you want to the cones. So you could have them as fractions if you're in year six or money through key stage two to work with different elements. If you're in upper key stage two, you could give the children much larger numbers to work with and practice rounding and practice mental calculations to work out their answers. So in terms of how they actually go and collect these cones, you could have the children running out one at a time and just grabbing a cone and coming back to their team. And that will allow you to go through this really quickly and play plenty of rounds and do plenty of maths. Um, but here's a, another couple of games. So one's called Finders Keepers, where we give every team a beanbag. And the idea is that they've got to throw the beanbag and hit a cone. And if they're successful in hitting a cone, then they can bring it back to their team. And we usually put in a rule with this game, which is that um, their beanbag can only touch one cone and only one cone just to stop them smashing the beanbag into the center and just hoping they'll hit one. And all the beanbags go, all the beanbags and all the cones go into the back of the hall. Um, but that's one way. Another way is to flip all the cones upside down 
Um, so they're turned upside down like dishes rather than domes. And the idea for this one is that the children bounce the ball out from their starting position and they try to flip the cone over by bouncing the ball on the side of the cone. Um, and then they can retrieve the cone and bring it back to the team. And you can do this in two ways. You can make it so that you've got to flip over a cone before you return to your team, or you can work it so that you have one attempt and then the next person goes. And with all of these type of cone games, you can give the children the values in advance if you'd like. So they're working um, to get the higher value cones first. It gives a bit of excitement to the staff, but they can also stop doing the maths as they're doing the movement in that case by adding up as they go. Another example is using oversized playing cards. So we quite often use these jumbo playing cards, a full deck of cards. And uh, in this video, we've got an activity where there's all the cards in the central area and then surrounding them, you've got cones with bean bags on and cones with balls on and cones that are empty. So one at a time, again, the children from their teams come out, they throw the ball in the air, catch it, and then place it onto a cone which doesn't have anything on it. Once they've done that, they can collect their card and bring it back to their base. So once they've got all their cards back to the base, they can flip them over. And then there's an element of surprise because they don't know what cards they've got. But then there's loads and loads of place value related maths games you can do. So for key stage one, you can talk about number ones to 10, or they could add three of the cards or order the cards from smallest to largest. But for key stage two, you can do this over and over again because you can ask the children to arrange their cards to show you the largest number and the smallest number and the largest three digit number or three digit even number to really hone in on those objectives during the autumn term, which are heavily dominated by place value. Um, or you could, you know, give them a countdown target to use their mental skills and they've got these five cards in front of them and they've got to add and subtract to, to reach their target. Um, aside from using cones and beanbags and balls, um, we've got this maths on the move trail, which I'm going to speak to Adam and, and we'll get this shared with you so you can use it. And the way that this works is that these are a printed resource. So you download them, print them out. And the idea is that the boxes around the sheet are for the children to fill their answers in. So they start at the top and work their way around. So the question sheets, there's four questions per sheet, and these can be cut out and then stuck around the hall. Um, so they answer a question, put their answer in the, in the box, and then go and find that answer on another trail sheet. Um, and it's a really good activity because it marks itself because they can't move on to the next question until they finish the last one and found that answer. Um, but we've got one of these for year one, two, year three, four, and year five, six, that we can share with you if that's something that you, you'd like or maybe you'd like to do with your class. Um, and I mentioned at the start, we're, we're working hard now on an English on the move version. So similar to this number trail, we've got a orienteering style resource, which focuses on um, spellings. So it focuses on homophones in this case. So these cards will be sliced up and Put around the hall or the field and then children will be given um, a missing word sheet so because this one focuses on homophones it uses the homophones from the national curriculum um, the ones that are listed in appendix two so the children have to fill in the correct word in the correct sentence record its number and then go and fill in another one um, if they want if you wanted to do it without actually using that sheet to make it a bit harder, you could just put the orienteering cards out and ask the children to go around, find them and create their own sentence using that word to check that they're using the right homophone. So again, there's a year one, two, a year three, four and a year five, six version of this, which we can um, get sent out to you. I think somebody's just entered the waiting room, Adam, so I'm just going to, because I'm the host, I can admit them. Uh, yeah, so that's another resource uh, that we can use to develop um, some English and keep them active at the same time. And finally, just before we go on to if there are any questions, I would just like to spend a couple of minutes talking about um, 
the Maths on the Move programme, which some of you might be aware of. Um, so all the activities that I've just shared are taken from Maths on the Move style lessons. And the way that we work it is that we've got a lessons objectives overview document, which details all of the lessons that we deliver. And this is aligned to the national curriculum. So um, on the screen now, you can see the, the year three maths lessons. So each group has, um, each year group has three booklets, which cover the age related expectations for that year. So typically schools will look at these objectives, select the children um, that would benefit from taking part in these objectives. And then it can be up to 16 children in key stage two and 10 in key stage one. So we can run the sessions back to back to allow a full class to take part. Um, but a lot of schools use it as an intervention for selected children to take part. Um, so on the screen, you see there's three different um, columns. There are booklets. So we arrive at the school with one of these booklets for each of the children to have. They're printed, ready for the children to fill in. Put the name on the front, that's theirs for 12 weeks. And then each week, we ask the children when they arrive at the lesson to have a go at five questions. And then when they, just before they leave, they have a go at five more similar style questions. And the middle part of the lesson is spent doing physically active learning activities, um, which relates to the specific learning objective of that week. So whatever you're covering in the class, we can, we can cover within a Maths on the Move lesson also. And at the end of the programme, we're able to provide all of these scores that the children have achieved so you can decide which objectives maybe still need additional work within the class um, or which children have done well when they've been on Maths on the Move and, and maybe would like to continue with it. Um, so the last academic year, we worked with over 5,000 children over 440 groups. And uh, what we found when we looked at all of the data that we had is that um, we could see that there was a difference between the children at the start and at the end of the lesson. So when they came to the lesson and did the questions cold without any support, um, they were getting on average 2.17 out of five, so 2.17 marks, which increased to 3.46 at the end of the lesson on average. And um, 93% of children who took part in Maths on the Move actually did show an increase um, from the pre to post lesson scores. And the last thing that I'd like to talk about is the, the confidence. So as well as feeding back in terms of how the children are doing with the actual maths questions, um, confidence is another feature of the report. So we asked the children to self-assess how confident they feel in maths and then give themselves another rating at the end of the programme. So in the last academic year, 80% of the pupils felt more confident um, as a result of taking part in Maths on the Move. So it's, it's a nice added extra that we put in the report so you can see how the children are feeling towards Maths towards the end of the programme too. So that was just a couple of minutes on Maths on the Move, but I am happy to field any questions on the program or if you think it's something that you know children in your school might enjoy or benefit from then adam might be the best person to speak to in your area about looking this in um, or finding out more but if there are any questions on anything that i've covered so far or any questions on the program then please either uh, turn your cams on and, and have a chat or put it into the chat box and i'll try my best to answer them Thank you, Andrew. Um, we, we've actually got uh, no, Mark um, and Cheryl and Will. We, um, all, all three of, of, of their schools have, have been taking part in Maths on the Move now for probably three years, I would say, the whole time that we've been delivering it. So I don't know if, not, not to put any of you on the spot, but I don't know if any of you want to uh, kind of share with, with the other people present your kind of experiences of Maths on the Move and how it might have helped the children taking part in your schools. Hi. Thank you, Cheryl. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> we use maths on Move all the time. And we've used it with loads of different groups. I think it makes a real difference for, for all, all of them, really. Um, I like the idea of tracking it. That's a really good idea that you do the before and after task because you, you need some kind of baseline nowadays, don't you, to put under people's noses if they ask you any questions. <laughs> but I don't know if any of the other teachers here in their careers have noticed this without any evidence. I think I've been once to, um, to observe somebody for an interview uh, for a job and they were year five children and there were huge boys in that class and it was absolutely evident to me that all of them were spending most of their time and most of their energy and their brain capacity in trying to sit still at the table <laughs> not in trying to learn the lesson and, and I think if you asked any of the adults now sitting here now and trying to concentrate on um, a zoom call for you know a whole day or whatever you've built in some activi activity haven't you Adam because we all need it and we're asking children to do that and they're absolutely programmed to be running around and being physical and it to me I don't know why we don't do more of it and why it isn't a bigger focus for everybody because I think it's obvious um, and we should do more of it it's a pity we don't have sometimes the um, the sort of uh, autonomy to just go and do these things that we know that need doing mm. so yeah i absolutely believe in it thank you cheryl and I, I, I know you were probably one of the first schools um that, that actually started doing maths on the move cheryl that we work with and i think i think probably the, the thing that appealed to you the most about it was i i, I might be i might be wrong here so correct me if i am but I'm sure you were using a, a, an alternative program which you'd got the resources for and you would you had your existing teaching staff uh, using those resources to deliver the lessons but the the issue was that you couldn't demonstrate the impact that those lessons were having on the children because it wasn't measured and that's where uh, maths on the move probably was a little bit unique uh, in the sense that you know children complete the pre and the post lesson questions which then school get back uh, on impact report so you can actually see the impact that the program is having over a over a, a period of time um, and that is probably what kind of sets this program uh, apart to other active maths um, uh, opportunities that are out there for schools i suppose yeah it's about being account accountable again isn't it and uh, if you're going to spend money on things then, then you need to be accountable um and you can't just say come and have a look <laughs> <laughs> but if you did you would still see it wouldn't you <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah thanks for that okay no problem is there anything else you'd like to add andrew or no, I just thought, to be honest, um, what Cheryl just said there absolutely summed it up perfectly in a minute, to be honest. Um, I, I remember when I was teaching, we actually um, went through the process of changing our timetable. So we were a village school and we had, um, it, and what I'm seeing from all the schools I go into, this is quite uncommon, but we used to have an afternoon break as well as the morning break, which I know is quite, a lot of people just go straight the way through. But then we had it as an optional thing. So you could take your class out if you were, not on you wouldn't you would be on duty for that for your class because that you were taking them out um but i always used to try and take them out for just five minutes if it was um if it was needed because after they've sat through maths and then english and then science and then you go into another lesson um by that point they're, they're cognitively tired and they need that time to be active ready to recharge and go again so i think you summed it up perfectly to be fair Thank you. Yeah, and I, I, I know it's something that you've you've shared with us quite a lot. Um, is uh, Dr. Chuck Hillman's? Um, although those images just they, they, they just fascinate me really. And um, you know, obviously there is quite common, um, but it's, it's very uh, prevalent that you know physical activity does have um, an impact on on retention and, and on learning. So. Um, yeah, no, thank you very much, Andrew, for your time and for, uh, for sharing that. It was, it was great. No problem. Thanks, Adam. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys.